Greetings and welcome to the new vlog and the new year and 2022 could hardly get off to a better start than with Licorice Pizza, the new film from Paul Thomas Anderson. Cooper Hoffman, the son of the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, plays a high school kid in 1973 LA who is pursuing a 20-something woman, played by the singer Alana Haim. He's also looking around for a money-making opportunity now that his child actor career is coming to an end. He sets up a cockamimi business selling waterbeds. You in charge? Yeah, I'm in charge. May I just speak with you for a second? Yeah, sure. Thanks. You can tell your crew to stop. Stop for a sec, guys. Um, so this is what I want to say to you. Um, do you know who I am? Yeah. Do you know uh, who my girlfriend is? Barbara Streisand? Barbara Streisand. Sand. Sand, yeah, like sands. Like the ocean, like beaches. Barbara Streisand? No, but Streisand. Sand. Streisand. Streisand. Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand. I can't tell you how gorgeous this film is. I've already got into trouble with more sober souls for excitably announcing on social media that it's probably the best film of 2022. Well, I did say probably. The title is taken from the name of a now defunct Southern California record store chain, which is, of course, never explicitly alluded to in the film, although there are plenty of Madeline jukebox slams. Hoffman is Gary Valentine, a heavy-set kid with iffy skin who turns his fast-talking non-charm on Alana, played by Alana Haim, a young woman working as the assistant to a photographer taking pictures of the high school kids. Haim has the charisma and beauty of a young Barbara Streisand, appropriate as Streisand's boyfriend John Peters, played by Bradley Cooper, puts in a fictional cameo. She is exasperated by Gary's interest in her, and yet also depressed and intrigued to realise that she does sort of like him in a way that is not quite Harold and Maud, and yet somehow not entirely platonic either. The course of their non-love naturally does not run smooth. In the face of Gary's obvious annoyingness and his own flirtations with other people, Alana has what can only be called a retaliatory age gap liaison with an ageing movie star played by Sean Penn and apparently modelled on William Holden and a political candidate of uncertain temperament played by Benny Safdie, which is incidentally the occasion for what appears to be a homage to the campaign office scenes from Taxi Driver. And why is it set in 1973? Well, partly for the delectable period detail and delicious playlist opportunities, but also, as arguably with Jonathan Franzen's new novel Crossroads, it's maybe because backdating the action to the disillusioned yet retro-hip 70s allows Anderson to explore and dramatise transgressive love and sex in the right mood of romantic adventure without getting bogged down in 21st century gender politics and maybe the ironising 70s make it easier to get away with the time-honoured male fantasy of the teen boy somehow entrancing an older woman. Well, this is such a great film. I'd watch it every day if I thought I could get away with it. Netflix have been coming up with some classy feature films over the Christmas New Year awards season period, and one such is definitely Munich, The Edge of War, adapted from the page-turning bestseller by Robert Harris, directed by Christian Schwachau, and starring Jeremy Irons as the careworn 30s Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who has been bullied and bamboozled by Hitler into attending a conference at Munich, whose purpose is to let the Nazis have the Czech Sudetenland. The drama imagines two young backstage figures, a German and an Englishman, once pals at Oxford University, who find themselves attending this conference on opposite sides as minor aides and translators. The German is now secretly anti-Nazi, and he approaches his old friend with a dangerous proposal. Men and women of Britain and the Empire, as long as war is not begun, there is always hope. Really good to see you again. What will you do for me? We are the last hope of Hitler to stop. It's a wild plan for Europe. Hitler is lying when he claims to want peace. People will suffer. That document is the proof. Wollen 
George Mackay plays Hugh Leggett, the young Brit functionary whose early undergraduate idealism and carefree demeanour has curdled into weary disillusionment and an unhappy marriage. Janis Niewerner plays Paul von Hartmann, the well-born young German who fell out with Hugh over Paul's early Hitler fan worship, but now Paul hates Hitler with a passion and hopes to overturn the Munich appeasement. Hitler himself is played by Ulrich Mathis. It's all entertaining stuff, and as with Frederick Forsyth's The Day of the Jackal, the fact that you know how it comes out in the end is no bar to enjoyment. But it's still a bit made for TV sometimes, and I think that's down to the fact that Jeremy Irons, though splendid, does make the young leads look a little bit lightweight. Now it's time for a feature we haven't had on this vlog for a while. It's Serendipity Corner. Yes, it's time to chance across something while browsing in the wildflower meadow of filmic culture. And this time, it's Lightning, or Inazuma, the 1952 film by the Japanese master of family dramas, Mikio Naruse. Now, there are a couple of Naruse films already streaming on BFI Player, but this is available for nothing on YouTube. Hideko Takamine, an actress who is a regular for Naruse, but also worked with Ozu and Kurosawa, plays Kyoko, a young Tokyo tour bus guide who lives at home with her mum. She has a tense relationship with her siblings, and all four, in fact, have different fathers, though whether this happened out of wedlock is not entirely clear. Still single and dismayed by the problems in her sister's marriages, Kyoko is deeply disillusioned to see how everyone begins circling around for a share of the life insurance payout when one sister is made a widow. Finally, she goes off to live on her own, though attracted to the unmarried man next door who plays the piano. In this scene, Narase almost leaves it ambiguous as to whether the piano music is diegetic or non-diegetic, whether it's her own mood music playing as it comes on to rain, and she decides to take his washing in. It's all building up to a lightning discharge of cathartic emotion, but even then there seems no chance of mother and daughter, for example, actually physically embracing. The delicacy and understatedness of lightning coexist with a particularly addictive kind of sentimentality and melodrama, which Naruse had learned from the novelist he adapted many times, Fumiko Hayashi. Maybe the closest Hollywood equivalent would be the so-called women's pictures of Douglas Sirk. It was a domestic style and rhetoric of movie making that flourished in Japanese cinema in this period, but in later years, for us, seemed to have migrated to TV. Lightning is a treat and available to stream on YouTube right now. That's it. I'm going to ask you to start 2022 in the right way by subscribing to this YouTube channel and leave a comment to say that you've subscribed. And also, those friends of yours. Tell them to subscribe too, and also use that money they've been given for Christmas to buy my book, The Films That Made Me. Thank you once again. Be seeing you.